Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I am your host, Doug Stewart, and I'm excited to talk with our guest today because this is a topic that I've been interested in for a little over a year because its phenomenon has become pretty well known in the West. So I want our listeners to know that this is not going to be the the last time we're going to have this conversation about critical race theory. So I have an historian on with us, Phil Magnus, who is the Senior Research Fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. He's the author of two books and over a dozen scholarly articles on a diverse array of topics, including the economics of slavery, the history of international trade, federal tax policy, economic inequality, and the economic dimensions of higher education. Phil, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I'm a white guy interested in critical race theory, and I'm interviewing another white guy who knows a lot about it and can explain it. But are you really going to give us a fair, like, explanation? Because you're white, so you by default surely can't really do that, right? Well, that's the funny thing about the ongoing debate about critical race theory is that its proponents have almost as like a standard trope response to any criticism or pushback against it have turn to rather than engaging the criticism, they'll look at the race or in some cases the race and the gender of the person that is the critic, the person that's uh, raising objections to some of the claims of critical race theory. And yet, oddly enough, there's a bit of a double standard here because a lot of the defenders of critical race theory itself are white males and they don't seem to apply that same standard to themselves. So uh, it's an oddity of an argument that keeps coming up. But at the same time, one thing that I'd point out is that critical race theory is not the only way to look at the problem of racial discrimination, uh, especially from a historical perspective. And I come from a scholarly tradition that tackles some of the same problems that critical race theory claims to be opposing. Prejudice, the uh, institutionalization of racial restrictions through the instruments Mm -hmm. of the state, uh, you name it. Going back in history, the legacy and problem of slavery. But as someone who approaches that from a different angle than the critical race theory tradition, that doesn't mean I don't care about racial discrimination. Quite the contrary. I'm arguing that I have a different perspective that has stronger explanations and stronger value in how to tackle these problems than what critical race theory is offering. Well, and it probably seems like the outcomes are probably even more advantageous to the people that they hope to help. I think that's entirely the case. I mean, if you look at the rise of the critical race theory movement in academia, it does not have a uh, demonstrable track record of actually alleviating the problem that it purports to be tackling. Quite the contrary, what it seems to do is just heighten the politicization and the rhetoric of dealing with the problem of discrimination and actual no material benefit that's been delivered. So the first time I seriously tried to get into critical race theory and kind of understand at least one of his proponents, you know, main take on it was Ibram X. Kendi's book, Stamped from the Beginning. A friend of mine recommended it. And in good faith, I ordered it. It was like nine bucks on Amazon. I was like, all right, I'll, I'll order this. I didn't realize how big it was. So I'm thumbing through it. And I'd be like, all right, I'm going to give this a serious shake, right? I'm going to not take Republican politicians' word for it, just, you know, without investigating it myself, whether or not this is actually worth reading or in thinking about, right? So I'm flipping through it, and there's this comment about the racist idea of personal responsibility that came from the Clinton administration. And I was like, wait, what? Right. All right, I'm not really interested in this anymore. That book's been on my shelf ever since. And so I don't know, maybe that book has more to offer me than that, but that was a big turnoff for me. And so I do feel like, however, that there are a lot of people out there who seem to not really understand how to tell others what it is, both those who are against it and for it. Yeah. So this might be a good opportunity to kind of like, in a nutshell, if that can even be done, what is critical race theory from from your angle? You know, when I hear that question, it's often put in the context, well, the critics of critical race theory can't define what critical race theory is. 
I've turned that question around on the proponents of critical race theory. And you ask someone like Ibram X. Kendi, or you ask some of the more uh, senior academics that founded the discipline, what is critical race theory? And what you get from them is basically word salad. It's a uh, vague platitudes that can never really come down and precisely define the definition. Mm -hmm. I think there's a video that's actually circulating on the internet of Ibram X. Kendi where he's asked in the Q&A session just to define what he means by racism in this critical race theory context. And he goes into this like circular jumble where he says, uh, well, racism is stuff that is racist and the institutions that are racist. And so using terms to define themselves and it becomes very clear early on that they don't have a good working functional definition of what they're even after. And I think that's intentional. It works for them. Yeah, it's by design. It works for them because it lets them decide that anything happening that they are disapprove of is racist. Right. So they've got a blanket term, a blanket concept that is poorly defined and oftentimes doesn't even really mean anything. But what they use is uh, that's an opportunity to pivot into these very strong far left ideological priors, which is what you mentioned in the Kendi book about rejecting individualism. And you find that they reject free market capitalism. They reject classical liberalism and values such as free speech and the Bill of Rights when they conflict with their ideological priors. But that's kind of the constantly moving set of definitions and, and standards that they've even set up in their own literature. It's something that's really hard to pin down. What I can give you is a, an attempt to explain what critical race theory is from its historical origins. And to do that, you have to go into a broader academic tradition that's referred to as critical theory. So what is critical theory? Well, you find out there's a lot of different iterations of it, critical race theory being one of them. There's also critical gender theory, critical pedagogy theory uh, that's applied to education, all sorts of different critical theories. And they're often interrelated in their ideological objectives. But what it comes down to is critical race theory is a critical theory applied to race. So you ask the question, what's a critical theory? This goes all the way back to about the 1930s and 40s. There's a group of uh, Western Marxist academics in Germany built around the University of Frankfurt. So they refer to themselves as the Frankfurt School. And what they attempted to do was identify a difference between the theory, the version of uh, theoretical approaches they take to understanding society from what they describe as traditional theory. So you've got two different types of theory, a critical theory and a traditional theory. And by definition, in the loosest sense, they say a critical theory is one that is emancipatory, one that advocates for undoing suffering and harm. And of course, they're talking about this in the Marxist sense. So they say emancipatory from capitalism is uh, basically a type of critical theory. They take the term itself out of two sources. One is uh, Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. But then the more direct is Karl Marx's Das Kapital, the subtitle of which is a critique of political economy. So they use Kant and, and Marx as examples of prior critical theories theories that are engaged in tearing down and emancipating from a prior traditional theory. And what they, they see by contrast is a traditional theory is one that props up the status quo, that props up those that are in power, props up the elites. So the, in this broad, very loosely defined framework, a critical theory is one that tries to topple the traditional theory status quo, which they see as reinforcing whatever power structures happen to exist that cause a discriminatory or an unequal outcome for the particular group that that critical theory is focused upon. So that's the practical application of it. And what you get is you jump forward to about the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, there's a movement that emerges out of uh, mostly legal scholarship at first, but then it spreads like wildfire into the humanities. And that is to take this critical theory framework and apply it strictly to the structure of race, the question of race, and they use this as a response to uh, first legal approaches that view race and racial discrimination through what I think most people think of it as a violation of rights, a violation of a constitutional right. And they challenge that on the grounds that they think that even though you can have something legally non-discriminatory, discrimination can persist and can persist in institutional arrangements. And I'd actually agree with them on that, that there's a case to be made that institutionalized discrimination 
absolutely exist even when it's illegal. And we need to investigate and understand that. But then they they jump from that very uh, almost banal observation, an entirely agreeable observation, into what you see in things like the Kennedy book. And then the conclusion is, well, if institutional forms of racism exist, therefore we must topple capitalism. Therefore we must uh, rid ourselves <laughs> of individualism and embrace this far left political narrative as the only solution to it. You know, as you describe some of the things that they talk about, it's like, oh, well, you know, most freedom loving libertarian types would kind of be like, yeah, let's challenge the status quo. Let's uh, make sure that there is no unjust power institutions. And we're like, rah, rah. And then it's like, but wait a second, they don't align almost at all because their values are not individualistic or they're not really based in constitutional rights and defense of individuality. It seems to be more based on identity. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I think it's absolutely true. And, and, you know, the second component here is not only are they anti-individualistic based around collective identities and power structures that are uh, playing out between identity groups, which is an outcropping of kind of a Hegelian mindset of a, a constant oppositional dialectical struggles. And the unit of the group is the racial identity group in critical race theory, just as in critical versions of gender theory would say that gender is the, the dividing line and so forth. So you can take any category here. But in critical race theory, it's a collective mindset from the very beginning. One thing I'd add to that, not only is it anti-individualistic in that sense, it's also explicitly hostile to free market economics, the critical race theory crowd. You see this in all of their early literature. Before it burst into the culture war scene of 2021, they've been working on critical race theory in academic circles for decades. You can go back to the formative texts that were published in the 1980s and 1990s, and this is by people like Richard Delgado and Kimberly uh, Crenshaw are are two of the big figures that are um, founders of the critical race theory tradition, and they are stating openly that some of the formative conferences where they started floating this approach were basically Marxist gatherings, basically people that wanted to overturn capitalism, and that's been carried forward as a baggage of the critical race theory movement from its inception. So it's not only accepting the basic concepts that are not generally controversial, the idea that, yes, there is institutionalized discrimination and racism that we should pay attention to. It's also they want you to accept the rest of this baggage, and that baggage is a very far left economic tradition that is hostile to everything that I think we believe in. Yeah. What's the connection between critical race theory and postmodernism, postmodern thinking? I think there's um, methodological tools that both of them interact in, and I think it becomes clearest in in the notion that postmodernism often elevates a notion of truth as not a fixed objective reality, but as a construct. Mm -hmm. And what you see often in the critical race theory literature is an embrace of that methodological rejection of, uh, of empirical reality and a tendency to treat assertions as constructs, factual assertions as if they're constructs. So uh, there's an overlap between the two, although it's not like a perfect overlap. It's more of a Venn diagram where they have a couple of intersection points. Yeah. So there are postmodernists that are anti-critical race theory, and there are critical race theorists that are not primarily postmodernists, but I think the tools are... Uh, compatible in many ways. You know, it tends to be easier to reject something when 100% of it is like just worthy of writing something off, right? Like being like, nope, you're completely wrong and so forth. But there's an appeal to what's going on with critical race theory or even not by name what people are doing. And they're like, oh, well, we want to We want to reduce racial tensions and we want to eliminate where racism still exists. And we want to, you know, make sure that systemic injustices are not disproportionately against black people or whatever it might be. And there's a lot of attraction there. And, you know, like we've already talked about, there's the there's a lot of attraction even in the theory of like critiquing the status quo and so forth. Right, Right. But. I think that almost makes it more dangerous because then people get sort of sucked into the tribe, if you will. We, right. <laughs> I know John McWhorter calls it a religion, yeah. which we could talk about a little bit later. But yeah, I mean, what do, what do you think there? Well, 
There's a very intentional sleight of hand that's played in this literature, and especially the uh, the disseminators of this literature, the popularizers, the media, people like Ibram X. Kendi and Nicole Hannah-Jones that are public expositors of critical race theory. What they do is they engage in a sleight of hand where they present it as something that's very innocuous sounding and actually uh, something that most people would agree with. We want to end racism. We want to end discrimination. We want to uh, study the legacy of slavery and come to terms with the problems that it created. And I think almost all listeners would agree with that. That yes, we want to end racism. We want to um, end racial discrimination. And they'll present that and they'll say, well, critical race theory is simply trying to end these problems. But that's not what they're doing at all. That's the bait and switch. That's what they hook you in on is something that's very innocuous and positive sounding. And then uh, once they've got you uh, convinced that this is a viable solution to these problems, then it's like off to the races with the Green New Deal and uh, yeah. radically overhauling the American economy and, and destroying American capitalism and uh, tax and spend progressivism that redistributes income, like all these unspoken ideological commitments that they just import in through the back door once they've, uh, they've hooked you on something that sounds very innocuous and indeed positive. Yeah, there's actually a fallacy name for that. I don't know if you want to go into the Mott and Bailey. I don't know yeah, if it's the officially Bailey. a fallacy. So, uh, this is like a, a thought experiment from philosophy. And the fallacy is, you know, in, the, in medieval times when uh, you built the castle, you'd put the keep of the castle on the tall hill because it's the most defensible spot. So the enemy army uh, has to go uphill to conquer your castle and the whole time you're shooting arrows down at them. So it's the strong position in the argument. But in the medieval castle, around every castle, there was also the bailey. And the bailey is the flat land at the bottom of the hill where the town is, where the uh, peasants live, basically, that work for the king that's up in his castle. And it's intentionally the less defensible part Uh and the idea here is that whenever an enemy comes along, everyone in the bailey retreats up into the keep and on the top of the mont, on the top of the hill. So this is used conceptually to describe a type of a fallacy where there's a pivot in the argument between the defensible position, the mont, and then the less defensible, wide open, um, harder to sell in its own right, but it's also imported through the back door, the bailey. So what critical race theory does is that their mot will be racism's wrong and we need to study institutionalized forms of discrimination. We need to reckon with the history of slavery. And most people will agree with that. And then what's going on is then they, they try to use that strong position in the mot to sneak in everything in the Bailey through the back door. And the Bailey is the Green New Deal and income redistribution mm, yeah. and overthrowing capitalism and uh yeah, a Marxist labor system or something, just all this baggage they're trying to bring in without actually having to defend it. And then they'll pivot between the two because when you point out, hey, wait a minute, critical race theory from its earliest origins is explicitly identifying itself as a Marxist movement, then they retreat to the mot and say, oh, no, that's we aren't that at all. All we want to do is end discrimination. And they're actually lying about what they're uh, what they're seeking. Yeah. So not everybody values what you and I would value. And if we have friends who are sort of intrigued by critical race theory or are totally captivated by it, whatever it might be, and we're trying to like find common ground, talk to them about it, and sort of at least listen to what critical race theory has to offer so that we can sort of maybe counter with our own arguments, but also just to fully understand it in a better way. Yeah. Is there something good? that we can say, hey, you know what? I do agree with this. In terms of the critical theory, not the like, we want to end racism platitudes type level, yeah. but like, yeah. what is it that you would recommend to like our listeners to be like, all right, if I have a friend who's sort of espousing these ideas and to engage them in a way, it's like, you know what? You're right about this. And then somehow have a fruitful conversation because it doesn't seem like everything is completely, absolutely bonkers. I mean, I, I was reading um, Delgado and... Stefanczyk, I think it's how, how you pronounce her name. Yeah. They're like little black and red book. It's like a primer. And I was reading it and they were dealing with particular cases in the justice system where justices were sort of basically like ruling from the bench, yeah. but doing things that were definitely against the status quo 
that we would find is good in a sense, nullifying right. bad laws against black people. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm cool with that. Right. Like there right. are some technical things that are actually worth saying, okay, yeah, you got a point there. But for me, I'll just say for me personally, I'm like, but liberalism can still get you there better. <laughs> right. Right. I think that's one of the openings that we have that we can point out here is that even where critical race theory has somewhat correctly diagnosed particular problems, particular forms of injustice in the criminal justice system or particular institutions that are segregated or that uh, inflict greater harms on black people than they do on white people. That's a starting point to a conversation of asking why, why do these institutions exist? Why do they persist? And one thing that I've argued in my own academic work and that I, I think we should pay greater attention to is that there are often alternative explanations to some of these same problems, to some of these same phenomena that the critical race theorists see, but they're more robust alternative explanations. They offer a better understanding of why racism persists. So I'll give you an example we can draw from economics. And if you go back to the early 20th century, when the minimum wage is, is really coming into vogue as this progressive tool to supposedly improve the working classes, what you find in it, if you dig deeper into the minimum wage literature, especially in that era, it was often explicitly espoused on racial lines. Because when they said we're trying to help the working classes, what they really meant is they were trying to help the white working classes. Mm. So these are uh, progressive racists that see black people as, as worthy of exclusion from the economy. And what they do is they rationalize that if you raise the minimum wage, it's going to put some people out of work. Basic economics is going to tell us that. And if you do it in a segregated society, the very first people that will be fired are African-Americans. Hmm. The people that are seen on the margins of society or the, the very bottom of the social ladder in a deeply racist society, it's going to be African-Americans that are harmed the most by minimum wage legislation. But if you're an advocate for the white working class, which many of these people were at the time, that was their tool to raise wages among white workers as you, you basically take away the jobs of black workers. Mm. So you're saying minimum wage is racist and we should cancel it. Right. Well, if you look at if you use the same logic, you go historically, it absolutely yeah. was at the turn of the century. Yeah, that's crazy. Hi, this is Carrie Baldwin. And if you like the Libertarian Christian podcast, you'll like our other podcast, Good News, Bad News, a roundtable where you can join me, Matt, Norman, Doug, Aaron, and others analyze the news from a Libertarian Christian perspective. Check us out on YouTube, your favorite podcast app, or on libertarianchristians.com slash roundtable. Well, let's go back in history a little bit more and uh, talk about the 1619 Project. And I did not subscribe to the New York Times. And I guess it would be 2019 that they were kind of launching this project. Am I right? Right, right. Yeah, so, so it was August 2019. Yeah, yeah, right. Because that would have been, you know, 400 years. So the... <laughs> The only exposure to the 1619 Project I had was your Facebook posts <laughs> about, right. about it. Yep. And yep. it was like, I had literally no interest in reading this like chock full of like error laden. I, I don't know. It's just like, I don't even know why anybody would be interested. Maybe you could explain why the phenomenon has morphed and your role in, in that a little bit. So what was it and what were they trying to do? I mean, why is it called that and so forth? Yeah, yeah. So um, it started in August... 2019 as an investigative issue of the New York Times Magazine to explore the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first slave ship in Jamestown, Virginia. And in doing so, the magazine issue was framed as a historical reckoning of the long legacy of slavery, basically from 1619 to the present day. So you have slavery from 1619 till its abolition in 1865. That's the era of slavery. And then the legacy of slavery is the problems that have persisted because of slavery ever since then. And again, in the most innocuous sense, this is a very worthyable project. I was originally excited when I opened the newspaper that morning and saw, hey, they're doing a, a cool new project on slavery. I work on slavery. I write on slavery. This ought to be interesting for me. And then I start to read it. And it was very much unlike any prior effort that the New York Times had done on this exact subject. The one that I, I use as the point of contrast most directly is 
about five years before this, the New York Times did a 150th anniversary series on the American Civil War. So they called the series Disunion, and it was a scholarly investigation of everything that had happened since the Civil War, trying to explain slavery, its legacies, the outcomes of the war, the day-by-day history of the war. So it was a multi-part series that ran for five years almost through the anniversaries. And it was done from a very scholarly perspective. It had multiple different viewpoints were represented, cutting-edge scholarship. I even wrote a few pieces for it myself, but I was one of hundreds of contributors to this thing. And here they are five years later, what could have been like a successor project to disunion. Instead, they went completely in the other direction. They told this one-sided echo chamber of a highly ideologized project coming from the far left that says, we're going to investigate the history and legacy of slavery, but every conclusion that's drawn out of it is geared not towards understanding slavery's legacy and harms, it's geared towards what looked very, very similar to a 2020 progressive left electoral agenda. Mm. And that's essentially what comes forth in the project is they, instead of investigating the past, instead of trying to understand it, they weaponize it to advocate for 2020 era progressive politics like income redistribution and socialized medicine and the Green New Deal and slavery reparations is another component that they build in there very strongly. But it's modern political advocacy masquerading as history, and it ends up being very sloppy history as a result because what do they do? They change and manipulate the evidence that they draw from the past to uh, make it better fit the political argument that they're trying to make today. So you and Nicole Hannah-Jones are pretty besties on Twitter, right? <laughs> That's, that seems to be the case. No, no, she's, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I have tangled with her on Twitter since actually fairly early on in the 1619 Project controversy. And really one of my earliest encounters with her, it sounds kind of ironic looking back in retrospect, but she came under fire within the first couple of weeks of the 1619 Project coming out, this again in fall of 2019, she came under fire for raising the issue of Abraham Lincoln's role in the colonization movement in the Civil War era. This was basically the the effort to resettle ex-slaves in the Caribbean, and some went Mm -hmm. back to Liberia and Africa. But the idea was that you solve the racial problem in the United States by very strongly encouraging and subsidizing African-Americans to leave the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's a retrograde 19th century approach, but it was also weirdly intertwined with the anti-slavery movement because the colonizationists saw this as a way to get rid of slavery. They also saw it as a way to, uh, even though it's paternalistic, they wanted to protect black people from what they saw as almost certain racial discrimination in a post-slavery South. Mm -hmm. So she raises this issue in the 1619 Project. She comes under fire. Turns out that she was basing some of her arguments in the 1619 Project's interpretation of Lincoln and colonization on my own historical scholarship, on a book that I had written in 2011 and several accompanying academic articles. And on Twitter, when she's facing her critics on this, she starts tweeting out links to my work. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I don't think I actually knew this part. Yeah, that's great. But she had not put two and two together to realize that Phil Magnus was the author of this work that she's tweeting out, was also a critic of other aspects of the 1619 Project, particularly its economics. (laughs) And someone points this out to her, and suddenly she goes silent on the Lincoln colonization stuff. And like a few weeks later, she just pops up, and it's all this ad hominem attacks and trashing of my reputation, the same type of approach that she's taken to pretty much all of her critics, any historian that's gone after her on a factual substantive basis has come under personal, almost defamatory attacks where she, yeah. she'll she jump in and say, well, you're not a true historian. Uh, yeah. Or she, she called Gordon Wood and James McPherson and uh, Victoria Bynum, Jim Oak, some of these very prominent Civil War historians and Revolutionary War historians that critiqued her, she said, oh, well, they're just white historians. We should uh, reject them. So it's back to that question you asked at the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> they weaponize race to dismiss their critics. And uh, it turns out, well, what did Nicole Hannah-Jones do on Twitter after she realized that the person she had been citing only a few weeks earlier to support her work was a critic of the 1619 Project? 
well, I came under the barrage of ad hominem attacks that she directs at anyone and everyone that engages her work in a uh, critical yet substantive way. So did your work make it into the footnotes of her new book? (laughs) <laughs> no, it did not. So even though back in, in the fall of 2019, she was citing my book, citing my work to substantiate her argument on Lincoln and colonization, well, she revises that in the new book that came out just a few weeks ago. And in my place, she swapped in a citation to Ibram X. Kendi, who has just a passing commentary on Lincoln and colonization. So Did he footnote you, maybe? <laughs> uh, not that I can tell. Uh, I can't. Uh, from from Kendi's book, uh, it doesn't seem to be a very deep historical analysis of Lincoln's colonization efforts. Rather, he's just kind of repeating talking points that he's gleaned from the uh, popular media and secondary sources. So it's not really a scholarly approach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I misunderstood the storyline there, or maybe I just only saw some of it or whatever, but I think you did affect somewhat of their like title changes or subtitle changes. In yes, there by yeah. pointing so, out. Um, this came about in the Matthew Desmond essay, which is a train wreck. It's the essay on capitalism and slavery. And Desmond is this far left sociologist who has never written so much as a word on the history of slavery before he was tasked with this article. So, so much for expertise, you know? <laughs> It'd be like if I walked into the English department and said, uh, I need an analysis of the trade deal that we're trying to um, arrange with the European Union. Uh, It was just someone completely outside of his element, outside of his expertise. Medical analysis? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's nonetheless what she did. And he writes this screed of an article that's almost entirely about trying to destroy capitalism by linking it to the history of slavery. And it's an echo chamber of deeply flawed ideological work that he just repeats verbatim. But because he's not familiar with it, he also kind of stumbles his way through it. It's not a competent reading even of this bad ideological literature he draws on. So one of the examples I pointed out and I discovered very early on is he, in his original essay, the one that appeared in the New York Times, he says that modern day accounting practices as exemplified by Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, trace and twist back to the uh, accounting books of the plantations. Oh, so the meme is Excel is racist. Yeah, Microsoft Excel is racist. It's tainted (laughs) by the plantations. And this is a proof that capitalism today is still using the legacy of the plantations just because we use Microsoft Excel. It's very clear to me, Phil. If you just open up Excel, take a look, you can see that they've made the cells more white and the lines black. (laughs) Right. So clearly Excel is racist. Yeah, and we joke about this. It'd be comical if it wasn't being put forth in the paper of record as this premier historical project, and yet there it is. There's the claim he makes, and you're reading this, and it's like a head-scratcher, but it gets even worse than that. To back up his claim, he cites this book by Caitlin Rosenthal called Accounting for Slavery, which is a history of how accounting was done on the plantations. Hmm. Desmond misread Caitlin Rosenthal's book because I opened it. I I have a copy of the book and I open it and there on like page eight of the book as she's laying out her project, she says, I want to clarify something for my readers. I am not claiming that Microsoft Excel traces back to the plantation books. I'm not claiming an origin story here. Oh my word. So here's this out of his league, arguably incompetent sociologist that's coming from a far left perspective that must have just glossed over that section. And then he completely transposes it and prints it in the New York times. And I point this out as an error to the editor of the New York times magazine, Jake Silverstein. And I get kind of this mealy mouth response, this, uh, this evasive, well, this is just interpretive disagreements on language and we don't see it as the error that you do. And I'm, and I'm sitting here saying, like, look, what? right here, go to page eight in this book. He clearly misrepresented the source. <laughs> Tell me you didn't read the book without telling me you didn't read the book. Exactly, exactly. It's time and time again. And there's several examples of this in Desmond's essay that I found, but the New York Times refused at the time, and this is back in early 2020, they refused to make a correction on this error that I had found. And yet the new book comes out. And what happens? You go to the same passage in Desmond's essay in the new book, and he's very quietly deleted the Microsoft Excel spreadsheet line. 
Mm, all right. I guess there's an improvement, I suppose. Yeah. So <laughs> there's a slight improvement, but it's also fairly incompetently executed uh. because even though he removed that line, he didn't change the text in the rest of the essay where he continues metaphorically referring to plantation accounting books as spreadsheets. So it's like this half-executed correction that they don't want to admit as a correction, and yet it's just inserted into the book as this way to uh, get around some very substantive criticisms of uh, not just the errors they make, but the ineptitude of this project as an attempt to be an authoritative study of what it claims to do. Is everything wrong with the 1619 Project? I mean, if I picked up a copy, would I get something good out of it, or is it just pretty much like propaganda for leftist agendas. Well, I say, so there were about, there were a dozen feature essays and a couple of, a whole bunch of smaller vignette type things. Some of it's poetry, some of it's cultural reflections in the original 1619 project. And then in the book, they've added several chapters to that. But of the 12 or so feature essays that appeared in the original version, I'd say seven or eight of them are, are not objectionable. They're interesting history there are uh, interesting cultural commentaries. There are original types of work, but they just generally did not come under criticism or scrutiny because there's really not too much that's wrong with them. Maybe you disagree with them on an editorial line, but on a factual basis, they're perfectly worthwhile contributions to the discussion. And then you have the bad essays. The problem essays are the ones like Nicole Hannah-Jones and Matthew Desmond that are so egregiously politicized and so riddled with errors that they became the focal point of all the criticism of the 1619 Project. Yeah. And I think what you have now is that the errors in those essays are overshadowing the remainder of the work. So all of these other scholars that are um, attached to it are having their work tied to the 1619 Project's title. And what it really comes down to is two or three really bad, awful, politicized essays that have become the premier narrative to come out of the 1619 Project. Do you, I don't want to like ask you to do the thinking for our listeners or for me, but like, do you have a list of like, hey, here's the chapters or is it just those authors are kind of like, yeah, be a little sketchy here, but the rest is kind of good. Is that kind of the delineation? Well, uh, I've said from the outset that Matthew Desmond's essay on slavery and capitalism is by far the weakest link. Okay. And I'd argue it it is damaged beyond repair. It is an anti-capitalist screed written by someone who is not even minimally familiar with the literature and the subject that he's writing about. Okay. It's pure ideology and it flows from error to error to error to give this narrative that's almost entirely around building up a case that capitalism today is tainted by slavery and therefore needs to be overthrown. Yeah. So I would say discard the Matthew Desmond essay. The Nicole Hannah Jones essay is probably the second most problematic I argued at the time of its original publication that it could have been strengthened and improved and actually made a a somewhat reasonable contribution to the literature if only she would address a couple of very large, clear, major errors in the original version of it. And that was mainly around the claim that the American Revolution was motivated by uh, a desire to protect slavery, Hmm. which is basically a baseless claim. It's a come from a bad misreading of evidence and a neglect of other evidence. And she's been raked over the coals over these errors about the American Revolution. But she could have, there was a moment in the fall of 2019 when she could have done the responsible thing as a journalist and said, look, uh, we overstated our case here. We've revisited it. Here's a much more nuanced articulation of that claim. She didn't do that. Instead, what she did is she doubled down and dug her heels in and insisted that there was absolutely nothing wrong with what she was claiming. Therefore, the historian critics that had raised salient points against this were in the wrong and deserved to have their reputations trashed as well. <laughs> and, you know, this is what I say on the Nicole Hannah Jones essay is read it with a very heavy grain of salt and an understanding this is written by someone who has become, over the course of the defense of the 1619 Project since its publication, an inflexible ideologue who uh, is really unwilling and uninterested in having a historical conversation unless that conversation is affirming her uh, Mm. preconceived ideological notions 
So she's the type that uses secondary sources from the historical literature by cherry picking only authors that agree with her already and then dismissing anyone that disagrees with her. Wow. What is there to be done about this unsettling trend toward <laughs> propaganda as history and the stuff we talked about earlier, the critical race theory? I mean, do you have do you have any advice, any thoughts on that? I mean, my whole approach to it is to point out the errors, point out the factual shortcomings, point out the bad behavior of the New York Times. I mean, we're talking about a newspaper that not only defended and stood by errors, clear errors when they were pointed out to them. This is also a newspaper that ghost edited the text of the 1619 Project itself to hide controversial passages in the lead up to Pulitzer Prize season. Mm. This is another discovery I made last year when Nicole Hannah-Jones was denying that she ever uh, made certain claims about replacing 1776 with 1619. And it's like, wait a minute, I remember reading that in the print edition back in 2019. And then you go back to it on the website and that text has been quietly edited out. I think we're at the point in the 1619 Project narrative that the actions of the New York Times, of Nicole Hannah-Jones, of Jake Silverstein, in the aftermath, in the fallout of the controversy, have so thoroughly discredited the project that we're no longer engaged in a historical debate over uh, what's accurate, what's uh, factually correct. We're also engaged in a, a fundamental debate about scholarly and journalistic ethics. And I think they've breached basic fundamental norms of journalistic ethics in the same sense that we would condemn a historian who engaged in plagiarism in, in one of his works we should condemn the New York Times for ghost editing and its journalism, for its behavior in the aftermath of the 1619 Project controversy. So where can people find you online if they want to read more of your stuff, buy your books? I mean, you wrote a critique of the 1619 Project. I can find that on Amazon. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, where else can people find your work and materials? I'd say AIER.org is where most of my day-to-day -day writings are published. So I'd encourage people to check that out. Excellent. Well, Phil, I appreciate you joining us. and. Maybe we'll again talk in the future about some more history and some other things that are possibly a little bit more in, <laughs> uplifting. I mean, this is a little, a little bit of a, like, oh, okay, there's a whole bunch of bad stuff going on that we need to be aware of. <laughs> so yep, now we're yeah. better equipped to analyze it because of you. Excellent. Well, thanks again for having me. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Thank you.